15th. Uh, I'd like to call this to uh, the agenda. Attendance has been taken. Uh, everybody's here. We're working with Councillor Bell, or sorry, with uh, with Councillor Wheat to to get him on. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, we are through Zoom, so if you're not talking, please put yourself on mute and remember to unmute when you do talk. Anybody to add anything to the agenda tonight? We do have one addendum. Anybody to add? Councillor Chambers. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to uh, pass on condolences to the Shelagy family. Ted Shelagy passed away this uh, past, uh, I guess it was uh, Monday or Sunday. At any rate, he was a former councillor with uh, Burford Township Council, and I served uh, many years with him. So I'd just like to uh, express my condolences to the family and uh, those of you who knew Ted, um, as I know many of you do, I uh, will certainly miss his uh, wisdom and, and, and good humor. So that's all, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate that, Councillor. Councillor Miller. Just, um, I'll just uh, add on to what Councillor Chambers said. Uh, Ted was out in our ward. And <sighs> Ted never asked me a question I knew the answer to. So um, he was always pushing the boundaries. I thought he, uh, thought he made me a better Councillor. He was one of those guys that got it. He understood he was an organic farmer. He had solar panels. So. Um, I will miss him um, as well, Mr. Chair. Um, can I add uh, one item under other business under number 10? And that's just talking a little bit about uh, electricity or lack thereof. Uh, Councilor Ferrier. And just that, uh, and I'll just bring it up now. I'll, I'll bring up a notice of motion when it comes to 7.2.2. Um, having already talked to the clerk about it and on on the news about Ted that that's very sad he was also very very helpful with a lot of um, federal and provincial politics as well um, across many party lines um, coming to events always had uh, nice things to say and, and advice for candidates of all colors and stripes and um, I was great at the debates and I know I had a lot of respect uh, from people outside of this community when it comes to the the politics side of things as well really noted Anybody else with any additions? Okay, uh, so as I say, we do have the one addendum 7.2.7. .7. Can I get approval of the agenda as a uh, Councillor Coleman? Second in Mayor Bailey, any further questions? All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Uh, declaration of pecuniary interest, uh, if you have any now or do so at the time, anyone? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, we do have a couple of delegations tonight. Uh, one is uh, in open session, one is in, in camera session. Um, the first in open session, we've got uh, Philip and I saw, I saw Jean on there as well. Um, these are the two gentlemen I spoke to you about that did the presentation to the Police Services Board uh, in regards to uh, the, the stop arm enforcement technology. Um, so we do have a presentation from them. Uh, gentlemen, I'm not sure who's gonna be speaking, but uh, welcome. And uh, go ahead, whenever you're ready. All right, wonderful. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jean Soulier. I'm a CEO and founder of Bus Patrol. Um, uh, so uh, thank you for having me today. I'm not for sure if Phil Cuckett is, is here um, representing the Transportation Consortium uh, of your region. Um, Phil, are you there? I am, Jean. Yes. Good okay, afternoon. wonderful. So you want to you give a, a couple words? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Uh, Jean and I are here to share with you some information that was previously vetted or staked through the Brent County Police Services Board back on the 16th of March. Uh, we're trying to reach out to all of the key stakeholders in our communal district uh, to ensure that we're collecting all the feedback we need and hopefully secure some uh, a path forward for this particular technology. Uh, Jean, as he mentioned, is the president and, um, well, pretty much a chief spokesman for Bus Patrol, and uh, his technology that he originally shared with me a number of years back uh, blew my mind, and it um, got the old uh, hamster running upstairs about, you know, what kind of uh, leverage we could use his technology for um, in order to form public-private partnerships in our region, and uh, the additional safety that this will bring to students of our region. Um, Jean is the resident expert in all things Bus Patrol, and as such, I will turn it over to him now to walk through the slide deck, and we'll be here uh, to answer any questions that may follow. Wonderful. So um, Bus Patrol. Um, bus Patrol is the world's most deployed school bus safety technology. Um, I, I'm a Canadian. I was born in Montreal, raised in Ontario. 
um, Mississauga and Brampton. And um, actually the, the, the birth of bus patrol was in Ontario. Um, next slide, if we can just show the timeline, I don't have control over the slide deck. So uh, there we go. So in 2014 is when this idea happened. Uh, I'm, I'm a technologist that um, is focused on or was focused on supply chain logistics. So moving our things efficiently through tech. Um, a friend of mine owned a school bus operator and told me I should use my big brain to protect kids because um, people were passing stop school buses uh, at an alarming rate. And I didn't really believe it. Um, that brought me to North Bay where we saw the we met the Ranger family um, and understood the consequences of illegal passes, uh, specifically how they affect rural communities. Uh, from there, um, we developed some pretty cool technology. Um, in 2017, uh, we began operations in America, uh, running uh, at the time the largest uh, school bus safety program in the country. Um, then in 2019, we developed an AI technology, which to this day is the only fully um, AI powered automated enforcement tech on earth. Um, her name's Ava. I'll introduce you to her in the in the presentation. And since then, we've been growing like crazy. So this little idea supported by the wonderful consortium of Ontario and people like Phil Cuckett um, was able to, to earn a $300 million investment from Brookfield Oak Tree in 2020. Um, and uh, like I said, now we're north of 300 employees growing to uh, over a thousand over the next 12 months, um, opening offices pretty much everywhere. So um, next slide, please. Uh, th this to, to underline is a Canadian uh, platform that we've built. So from an automated enforcement perspective, uh, we are completely cloud connected. We don't run on the public internet. Um, everything is, all the data stays in the country through Amazon Web Services um, data center in Montreal. Um, and everything is PCI and SOC 2 compliant. Um, latest and greatest uh, privacy uh, encryption security that's available today. Uh, next slide. Once you wire a school bus for enforcement, what it allows you to do is deliver a lot of other great features. The safety is about more than issuing a ticket. It's about how we bring our children safely to and from school. And that involves planning routes efficiently, um, training drivers, um, making sure kids on the bus are okay and they're not subjected to things like bullying and violence. Um, so we've partnered with a bunch of uh, great companies like Bus Planner and Samsung and Zonar to deliver a full stack of technology to modernize the school bus. When you walk on a school bus today, it doesn't look much different from the one we walked on when we were kids, and, and Bus Patrol is changing that. Um, next slide. Um, the first processing center, and there will be more, Belleville is actually going to be building one as well, um, but the first one in Ontario was Peel Region. They passed a motion that will be live in September, um, and they will be welcoming communities from uh, across the province to join. Belleville will be doing the same thing, um, and uh, Chatham Kent as well has, has demonstrated interest to build a processing center um, using Bus Patrol's technology. Um, the bottom line is, is that Bus Patrol has been involved in all phases of legislation in Ontario uh, since the very beginning. We helped draft the regulations, um, pass the laws uh, with the support of people like Rick Nichols um, and uh, Premier Ford, uh, who actually um, uh, announced and thanked public, thank Bus Patrol publicly for the work we did in Mattawa. Um, next slide. So the, the concept um, that's been missing in school bus is this um, concept of money. Uh, unfortunately, um, there hasn't been enough investment uh, and, and bus patrols changed that. We made a decision early on that we had to equip 100% of the buses we served. Uh, and that's because 80% uh, of the violations may come from the most trafficked areas, but the deaths almost uniquely come from country roads where the speed of travel is much faster and the risk is much more. Um, so uh, that's what we did. We decided we were gonna build a company that put equipment everywhere. And we weren't gonna let a child's postal code determine the level of safety they enjoyed. And we were gonna really put the cost of these investments right squarely on the backs of those who break the law, um, carelessly putting them at risk. And that's what we've done. So our entire program is zero cost, upfront cost to municipalities, school districts, consortiums. They're completely violator funded. Um, the ticket revenue is what goes back into the program to ensure that 100% of the fleet is covered. Bus Patrol um, takes that, that Com makes that commitment, the financial commitment to deploy this technology up front. And then over time, we're able to recover the funds um, to, to make a business of this. And, and it's working tremendously well. Next slide, please. 
<clears throat> so bus patrol covers everything. When I say everything, I mean the software licenses, the signs in the road, um, the PSA campaigns, the maintenance of the hardware, all the customer support, violator education, as well as the adjudication integration. So today that's the POA courts. Um, pretty soon that's going to be AMPS, the Administrative Municipal Penalty System um, that should be live sometime in early 2022. Notwithstanding, bus patrol programs are ready to roll now. Uh, we do not have to wait um, to get deliver child safety uh, to every community in the province. Um, again, it doesn't matter what traffic patterns your city has. Um, bus patrol is willing to put, and we hope to put our equipment on every single bus uh, in, in Ontario, in Quebec, in America, anywhere. Um, our mission is squarely focused on child safety. Next slide, please. So I'm going to introduce you to our tech now. So Ava, um, she is our AI engine. Um, she can monitor up to eight lanes of traffic in a variety of weather conditions and lighting conditions. Her plate capture is 4K in resolution, so she can see a violator's license plate more clearly than people watch movies at home. And all this was built by our engineers. We're all engineers from either the military, aerospace, um, or transportation. Um, and uh, that's why we've built such robust tech. We own everything. The hardware is ours. The IP is ours. The firmware. Everything that powers this technology from the collection of the evidence and the video and the data all the way to the back end processing is um, proprietary to Bus Patrol um, and no one can do it better than us. Next slide. So the process is pretty simple. Um, there is no driver intervention whatsoever. Ava does everything. She'll collect all the data and identify whether a car has illegally passed the school bus or not. Once that's been done, um, the evidence is then finalized for quality assurance purposes by bus patrol technicians and then put in front of a provincial offenses officer. Bus patrol does not approve a ticket. It's always the provincial offense officer that will decide whether a ticket should be issued or not. Um, next slide, please. Once the fine is approved by the provincial offenses officer, then all the provisioning uh, and printing and mailing of that ticket is done by bus patrol. Um, we print it, mail it to the offender. They go online and they get to see a video of their car passing a stop school bus. 95% um, of people who see that video pay the minute they see it. 4% will pay their ticket within 90 days and less than 1% can test. Um, this violation is, is, is interesting um, in the sense that there's a lot of shame to this. Communities accept it and they don't accept it when people pass stop school buses. Um, so people don't go to work to complain and say things like this is a tax and some of the things we've heard around red light or speed. Um, we actually use that that emotion um, to be able to change uh, behavior in a material way. And that behavioral change is really what we're striking to achieve. And we do that through our full fleet deployments. Um, what I can say is the reflex we're trying to instill in people is the similar is similar reflex when we're driving down the highway and we see a, a patrol car. Um, we hit our brake, then we look at our speed. Our goal is to make every motorist hit their brake when they see a stop school bus so that even that moment of hesitation could, could save a life. Um, next slide, please. Uh, on top of all this, we provide amazing data and, and to enable data-driven decision-making. And some examples are if we see a specific stop where kids are crossing and there's frequent violations, uh, we can work with Phil's team to make sure that they move that stop or that we install signage. Um, our goal is to be proactive, is not to just be reactive to a situation. Um, so we're leveraging this data at all times. So I'll give you an example, Suffolk County, we're deployed on 5,000 school buses, the largest program uh, in, in the industry. But thanks for all your help, honey. Um, and, uh, and, and we deployed, we installed 44 signs to start the program. Then we used the data to determine where the violations were happening most, and that enabled us to install another 50 signs to warn a motorist as they're approaching places where, where school buses are frequently stopping. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this is my, my favorite slide of all. Um, and that's the one that says 98% of people who get a ticket through our program don't get a second one. Um, so that tells us the program is working. Um, we, we've been able to demonstrate through our programs that we've been operating since 2017, a reduction in violations of anywhere from 20 to 30% year over year. Um, people are surprised in the first year to see how many times the, these laws are, are broken. In Suffolk County, in the first uh, month, we uh, issued 12,000 warnings, 12,000. I just wanna jump in so you have one minute remaining. Perfect, thank you. So um, 
so again, this is a very serious problem. It happens a lot more than most people think. And Bus Patrol has uh, developed a unique program that changes driver behavior at the same time as putting important technology in the hands of people like Phil so they can do the best job possible to ensure the journey to and from school is a safer one for your kids. Uh, we look forward to your support and we look forward to working with you in bringing this wonderful technology to your region. So thank you for the opportunity to present and I'd like to open it up to any questions if anyone may have any. Okay, um, thank you very much for that presentation, guys. Um, as I relayed on to council when I saw the police services board, I think this is a, an amazing product to, that can do uh, some fantastic things. So uh, questions, anybody have any questions? Councilor Gatward. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through you to Jason, have you um, pitched your equipment to the Grand Erie District School Board and the Brant Haldeman Norfolk uh, Catholic District School Board because they're responsible for the school buses in our area, the purchasing and equipping of those buses. I can comment on that. Um, my position actually is responsible for providing the transportation for Grand Erie for Brand Health and Norfolk Catholic, as well as the French Catholic, uh, Catholic um, Mont Avignon is the, the school board. So I'm responsible for overseeing uh, their student transportation uh, to and from school as well as school to school. And they are entirely on board uh, for the implementation of this particular program. But we require a municipal buy-in as well. Um, as school boards um, have a significant vested interest in student safety. However, we don't have the ability to fund a program as it is the ticket revenue, uh, which is controlled by the municipality, which would ultimately allow the program to take place. You said you don't have the ability to fund it. That's controlled by us. Um, I believe it's the province that provides education funding budget. But that aside, my, my second question is, have you ever heard of um, gatekeeper software? Yes, I have. Is that similar to what you use? Um, it's, it's, no, it's not really in the sense that gatekeeper is a camera manufacturer. Um, they don't offer the full backend processing of all of the evidence and all of the automation that goes into building these programs. They also don't have any AI technology uh, in order to um, properly enforce the law. Um, and they're not installed anywhere um, nearly as, as much as, as Bus Patrol is. They are a small manufacturer out of Vancouver, British Columbia that, that I know fairly well. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. No problem. Yeah. Councillor Bell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to the delegation. Uh, I think you mentioned that the acceptance of this system is much greater than it is for automatic speed enforcement. Correct. What is the fine for violation in, in the case of passing a school bus? I think I know, but you could tell me. Sure, it's $490. Okay, so uh, part, of, part of my thinking is we're, we're about to install automatic speed enforcement. I'm not sure we get our uh, uh, penalties to that level. Uh, and I wonder to, to what degree that is the driving force. I, I would like to think it's more the fear of, of hurting a child that causes people not to do it again. But do, do you have any, any commentary on that? Um, well, absolutely. I mean, first of all, the fine is, is not a small one. So um, it is a, a lesson. Uh, the video is also um, a very interesting education tool because it's hard to argue th these, these um, infractions when you actually see a live video of the car passing the stop school bus. So it becomes one of those moments where um, even when you go to contest, if you were to go to contest, um, these videos are shown uh, in front of your peers. And um, you know, it, once you go through that process, once you don't want to go through it again. And I can tell you that people also, um, they realize we, in our processing centers, we actually get letters from people thanking us, letters saying, thank you for making us aware of this. I had an Uber driver one day um, when I, he asked me what I did for a living and I told him, and he said, my, I got one and my wife got one. And it, it caused an interesting discussion at the dinner table. Thank you. So I, I don't, I don't think other automated enforcement programs get thank yous, but um, I think everyone cares about children um, and everyone uh, wants to protect our future. So uh, that's why I think these programs are so well accepted. Yeah, thank you. One further question, if I may, Mr. Chair. Sure. Uh, can your technology uh, make sure that buses stop in only the right places? 
And I, I give an example that I was coming down Rest Eggers Road a couple of years ago when a school bus pulled into what was zoned as a no stopping zone. And, and of course that throws people out. People expect buses to stop in certain places, but not to stop in other places. Yeah, so I mean, that, that's a great point. Um, first of all, the routing systems that uh, are enabled through, through these technologies, we plan them to make sure we don't stop in those areas. However, if bus drivers do not stop where they should, we know that. And then we can make changes, we can train drivers, and this is a great tool to train drivers, but also train kids. Um, that's, that's one thing where it's their little feet that cross the street and they have a responsibility to play in their own safety. So now you've got these images and these tools and this technology, and, and we also provide actually education material for schools, which would be rolled out alongside these programs to make sure that we're really educating everyone to make sure that we have a, a positive impact in reducing the behavior. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for your questions. Councilor Chambers. Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Chairman. I'm wondering if you could clarify the law for me. Is the law that you cannot pass a stop school bus or is the law that you cannot uh, pass a school bus with its lights flashing? It's lights flashing. So it's illegal to pass a stop school bus with its overhead red lights flashing. Just to, if I might, just to clarify, if a, if a school bus is moving with its flashing lights on and you get kind of caught in no man's land uh are you supposed to stop or is is, is a violation that bus has to be stopped sure sure so um the operating procedures of a school bus are quite deliberate and ontario has just passed the amber light legislation um which uh will make it so that the school bus will be flashing amber lights to notify the drivers around it that it's about to stop then it will flash its red lights then it will stop deploying its stop arm. And then at that point, it will let the, ch the children off. Bus patrol in its evidence packages captures every one of those moments. So when the amber lights are flashing, when the red lights are flashing, when the stop arm is deployed, and that's part of the evidence package that provincial offense officers use to determine, make the determination as to whether the car had enough time to stop or not. So we do, um, recognize that it's possible for these call it close judgment calls and those calls are always put in the hands of provincial offense officers and they are given all the tools to make the proper um, determination thank you my pleasure any other questions okay seeing none uh thank you very much gentlemen for your presentation and uh we will uh, how do we do we want to look after this right now, committee? Uh, how does the committee, what do you want to deal with this? Councillor Bell? I think we move to receive. Okay. Seconder for that, Mayor Bailey. Any further questions? Councillor Howes. Uh, just a quick one, Mr. Chair. Uh, how was it received when it came to police services? Quite positive. Um, it, it was, uh, as I say, they come in, They uh, there was a couple additions to their presentation. It was a little bit longer for the police services board. There was a few videos and it actually showed some of the evidence of, of vehicles passing. And and as John said there, it's, it, it is, it's, it's quite uh, um, impacting, I think is the word that I want to use here. When you see this, the bus is completely stopped, flashers going, arm out, and you see the vehicles coming by. So it, uh, it was definitely something the police services board uh, spoke highly of, and uh, that's why we wanted to get it in front of council. Well, and so to that extent, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if between police services board or this committee, whether we should be going a little bit further than just receiving it as information. And, and like, it, it, I, I'm not quite clear on the procedure, but should we be, you know, suggesting a letter of recommendation to the school board um, just, just thoughts. Uh, well, I would, uh, Jean, does it have to, it would have to go through, um, I guess it would go through you, Phil, to the transportation? From my end, uh, the school boards are already on board with signing on to a, an agreement, uh, but ultimately the agreement would have to be between uh, the County of Brant and Bus Patrol. 
um, at which point the school boards would participate. Uh, you and Bus Patrol would work together on financing uh, the and doing the revenue share of the ticket revenue. We would then allow for the technology to be deployed on our school buses, uh, which we contract and pay for. So it's a, it's a three-way partnership, but without the county, um, it can't move forward. Okay. Okay, so I've got Councillor Miller, Councillor Coleman, Councillor Ferrier. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, uh, Councillor Houses is, is um, along the same lines as what I was suggesting rather than just receive, which is great. Um, I'd also like to refer it to staff for a report so we can see what the next steps are as far as uh, getting an agreement in place. And I'm looking for a second. Okay. I think you got a seconder in Councillor Howes there. Um, Councillor Coleman, um, can you speak to that motion? Um, I was, I'm fully in favor of the motion, Mr. Chair, and, and I was uh, uh, totally agree with Councillor Miller that I was going to make that motion to move this on and send it down to staff and, and go from there. So thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Ferrier and then Councillor Gatward. Great minds all thinking alike. I was just going to say the same. So, Councillor Gatward, then Councillor Bell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, through you, the um, buses in the community are used sometimes jointly uh, in the city and the county, and they travel from the county into the city of Brantford. Are they going to be sharing this partnership? with the county uh, through you to fill, I guess. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, the Brantford Police Services Board had the exact same question with the uh, level of integration between county and city. Uh, they posed that exact same question and we're very thankful that uh, Brant County was a little bit ahead of them when it came to delegations and presentations both to their Police Services Board as well as county councils. Uh, as such, uh, the idea is that 100% of the fleet is uh, deployed and then Jean uses the long last, the longitude latitude locations to enforce those um, citations only in jurisdictions or areas that have uh, signed on to an agreement with them. So in the event that the county is ahead of the city of Brantford uh, in entering into an agreement with bus patrol, um, citations would only be issued uh, in the county itself and when the bus passes or breaks that threshold heads into the city itself until Brantford signs on to the agreement as well, uh, no citations would be issued uh, in their area, if you will. And my last question, thank you, is do you have any idea what the approximate cost is? Um, so there is no upfront cost. Um, the way that the program works is bus patrol pays for 100% of the systems. Uh, their maintenance, the data, everything that goes into it. Bus Patrol retains 60% of collected ticket revenue and our participating um, jurisdictions, municipalities, enjoy 40%. Their 40% is net of all costs, so um, it's straight to the bottom line and there's nothing to worry about. We make sure that we pay for everything and that is including um, the costs of the provincial offenses officers who are, um, whose time is being used in support of the program. Thank you. My pleasure. Councillor Bell, last, last question, and then we'll, we'll get to the vote here. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, question to Phil, I think. C could you explain the, the, the relationship that the county will have in this? I, I'm not quite sure I understand why the county is a player when the school bus system operates for the school board. Thank you, sir. Uh, the county is the critical uh, piece of this puzzle because it is through the municipality that uh, the police can effectively um, enforce the Highway Traffic Act. The school board has no jurisdiction and uh, is not able to effectively fund the program uh, without the county support. Um, again, we allow the technology to, to be deployed on our school buses with the significant benefit being um, increased student safety, which is what we're all about. Uh, the county at that point uh, gets the revenue share with uh, bus patrol on citations issued uh, within their jurisdiction itself. So without the county, no ticket can be issued. And as such, Jean can't put his camera systems on my buses. Okay. Well, again, thank you for the presentation. I think we, uh, we, we're all, it looks to be, we're all on board here. We do have a motion to receive and forward to staff for a report has been seconded. No further questions. All in favor? We, yes. And opposed? Okay, uh, note that was passed unanimously. Thank you very much. So what'll happen now is um, uh, staff will come back with a report, guys. I'm not sure if they'll uh, 
uh, reach out to you folks. Uh, they may, and then uh, we'll understand next steps and go from there. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. We appreciate the time. Be safe. Thank you so Thanks, much, guys. everyone. Enjoy your evening. Okay. Um, thank you for that. So the second delegation we have is a little different tonight. We have an in-camera delegation. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to let Adam set things up. There's a few people that need to go into the waiting room. Um, so bear with us here. He's going to stop the feed. We're going to put a few people into the waiting room. All those in favor? Yes. Opposed? That is carried. Um, any business arising from those minutes? Seeing none, we'll move on to section seven, consent items. Uh, we have uh, uh, consent items to be approved. Uh, we'll do them singular. Uh, so 7.1.1, Councillor Coleman. Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Chair, I was gonna move them all. Okay, uh, anybody, want, anybody want any of them pulled? Councillor Miller? 7.1.2, please. Okay. Anybody else? Councillor Gatward? You're on mute, Councillor. Thank you. 7.1.4. 7.1.4. Okay. Um, so we got 0. 0.2 and 0. 0.4. So we've got seven. Point, anybody else want any of them pulled? I do have a I do have a question on 711 myself. So the only one that's left is 7.1.3, Councillor Coleman. Seconder for 7.1.3. Councillor Howes, any questions for 7.1.3? All those in favor? Yes. Opposed? 7.1.3 is carried. Uh, we'll go back to 7.1.1. Um, a quick question, if I could, on this one here. Um, if we, it's on page 32 of our package. Um, I'm curious as to why the the extra amount is not exactly. It, it's actually more than the total of the two numbers. Just bear with me. I'm just bringing it up here. Stand by. Little technical difficulty here. So the number was uh, 439,000 for Ellis Ave and 96,000 for Bethel Road, which is 535, and yet the shortfall is less than that. I was just curious as to why the, the extra in there. Mr. Walton? Through you, Mr. Chair, to yourself. Um, I think that the reason is, is that this is the amount that they wanted to use up from the gas tax um, 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 reserve um, for this project. Okay, so that, that was intended then? I believe so. Okay. And, and all they would transfer is what they, the actual amount, so. Okay, I appreciate that. Okay, so uh, we'll go 7.1.1, uh, 7 1. can I get a mover for that? Mayor Please. Bailey, seconder, Please. Councillor McCall, sorry, Councillor, uh, Councillor Wheat. Any questions on 7.1.1? All those in favor? Yes. Opposed? That is carried. Uh, moving on to 7.1.2. Councillor Miller, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my understanding is um, so a lot of these construction tenders, the earlier in the season you get them out, the better you deal you get because they tend to get a little bit busier than the quotes come in and they just put any kind of price they want on it because they don't really care if they get the business or not. They're so busy. So having said that, anyways, that's my understanding. Um, the recommendation talks about internal and external capacity challenges. It talks about the global pandemic. Obviously, we're, we're all aware of that. Um, external capacity challenges, we can't really do too much about. Um, we can address the internal capacity challenges. My question is, um, are we going to address those for next year? To those that... Mr. Walton? Through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Miller, actually, we um, um, I had a meeting today which um, involved uh, um, the CAO and the um, uh, Director of Infrastructure, and we, we talked uh, about that as one of the discussion items that we had as to what um, what we could do better next year to um, 
um, have our, our, our jobs ready sooner. And, um, and um, um, you know, obviously some of the things that we, we, we dealt with this year, um, uh, we weren't able to deal with because of, you know, what was going on, but uh, planning for another year, yes, uh, we, we are um, looking forward to um, um, doing, uh, having things out earlier. Okay, I just I'll I'll just say, Mr. Chair. That, I mean, I have full faith in you, Rob. I have full faith in our CAO. So, get her done for next year. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, sorry, I do have a question myself on seven point one point two. Um, if if we look at uh, the the bids that were brought in there, and the the previous one, Coco Paving, uh, won that bid. Uh, the next one, Associated Paving, won that bid. Um, for the second one. Um, Coco paving was was only uh, seventy six or seventy three thousand dollars more than the uh, associated paving. Paving, and I'm just curious: um, do we ever like if if a certain company has the one? Is there anything um, um, in the negotiations that might state that if they get a second one, we might get a better price on the two of them? Um, as I say, it, it, it's it's just it's five percent more. For the associated, but Coco Paving, I I'm just curious if they would have potentially given a better price had they have gotten both. I don't know. I'm just looking for comment on that, if I could. Through, through you, Mr. Chair, um, to the committee. Um, in this case, um, these were tendered separately, so there's no ability to do that. If they were part of same, the same uh, tender, there are ways that you could set it up so you would have potential of joint awards and the like, but the, the, the specs as to how you would do that would have to be laid out in the tender. Okay. Um, there also are the potential in the future of, um, of us um, tendering more of these as, as, as um, um, you know, omnibus um, um, tenders that would include more projects together. Um, that, is, that is the potential. And, and I'd like to, uh, for us to look at that for, for certain projects where it makes sense. There's some right. places where it makes sense and there's some where it doesn't make any sense um so yes okay no i, I appreciate that um council gabbard is this for 7.1.2 okay go ahead please thank you um yeah i um was surprised to read on page two about the um storm sewer that's going to run all the way down mount pleasant road to the nature park i um it's the first time reading about that and that I knew about it. Um, I thought that the original complaint about the drainage at the windmill was going to be just fixed between the windmill and the Mount Pleasant Park to the um, to the west. But now it appears that that project is um, morphed into a huge um, project to the tune of eight hundred and twenty. Five thousand dollars. Is that a firm number, or are we going to have to um, um, look at that number for budget time? And was that budgeted for twenty twenty one? Mr. Walton, through, through you, Mr. Um, um, Chair, um, to Councillor Goward. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head what the budget number is for um, for that. We certainly will be able to deal with the budget figure here through um, reallocation of jobs because, as, as we've stated before, because of the pandemic, there are some jobs that won't be able to be completed this year. So when that tender is brought forward, we'll be able to bring forward more information on that. The one good thing I will note is, though, is that um, we've um, found a, a, a good way within our right-of-ways to fix a drainage problem there that... Um, was a drainage problem because there was no good outlet for this. Now there is a good outlet to take it uh, down Mount Pleasant Road and we will solve that problem for both the right of way and, uh, and the windmill parking lot as well. So um, the, the direction that that goes to the north was into an old award drain, which we would have had a, quite a process to, um, to upgrade. And uh, this is a much more efficient way for us to, to deal with it and upgrade our infrastructure on Mount Pleasant Road at the same time. So it's, it's part of the award drain and the highway storm drainage that was put in when Highway 24 was created. That's that's the old highway. Through you, so Mr. Chair, replacing. Councillor Gatward, we'll be replacing the storm sewer, which goes south along Mount Pleasant Road, which would have been, yes, part of the original highway drain, um, probably quite an old drain, I suppose. 
the, the old ward drain goes to the north from there. So there is a split in the drains here, but it does work to take it south. You good with that, Councillor? Yes, and, and the other question I had with regarding the Jenkins Road, um, that, that was due to be done last year and was delayed because of COVID. So the tender is now just going out to do it this year. And um, it's good to see that maybe they can use some of the material at Biggers Lane. Um, but are they gonna do this after the grain harvest? Can they, since it's been delayed one year already, because it says, um, you know, it might be delayed. And I guess I'm just concerned we continue to get further and further behind on these projects. And we, we tell people in the community, oh, they're gonna do it. And, and then it doesn't get done. And, and then, oh, well, it got delayed because of COVID, but they're gonna do it this year. And then it doesn't get done again. And it makes me feel like I'm, that the taxpayers are gonna start not believing us anymore because like I told them about Birch Road and, and now we're gonna do Ellis Ave instead. And I get very frustrated because we keep changing things. And I, I, I know it's not, um, general manager you're doing and certainly we never expected COVID to hit our construction program either. Um, can you answer me Rob are most paving companies though and most construction companies are they not working under COVID rules in the fields? Well Hear you, Mr. Chair, to uh, Councillor Gowood. Yes, most of them are, but some of them are um, having delays due to um, parts of their crew having to, to self-isolate um, um, and that sort of thing. With respect to Jenkins Road, Jenkins Road is planned to happen. We are planning to do Jenkins Road, but as noted in the report, we do not plan to do anything on Brant Mill Road. So in front of the, um, the flour mill and to the flour mill, we are not going to do that project this year, which will not hamper their access. That, that section road is already paved. So it's not as though we're delaying anything. That will be planned for next year at an appropriate time that we can get that done and not impact their operations. So Jenkins Road, yes. Grant Mill portion of this, no. Great, thank you. And they're going to improve that intersection where I had to move out of the way for a transport truck because there wasn't enough room for both of us. Okay, so for 7.1.2, are there any other questions? All in favor? Uh, all in favor of seven point one point two? Yes. Opposed. That is carried. Uh, Councillor Gatward, you had a question on seven point one point four. Go ahead, please. Um, it was just with respect to the um, back page, Mr. Chairman, um, where the uh, report says the provincial government has reduced the commercial and industrial education rates by 29.6%. And um, I asked our, the author of the report, well, where is the government making that up? Are they shifting that reduction to another tax class? She does state that it's not being added to residential, but I thought maybe it was gonna be shifted to farm or one of those other classes on the list. And she said, no. And so maybe that's just a cut in education funding. I don't know, but it, it would be nice to know. Um, that is your question then? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm wondering. I see Christine's coming on here. Can you respond to that? Yes, sure. sorry. Yes, I can. Um, there is no um, indication that they are going to cut funding. Um, they have not indicated anything where they're getting it. 
we it's only the amount that we pay to the school boards. The rest is made up by the pro, the provincial government. So there should be no uh, cuts to the school boards. It's just where the money comes from, whether it's from us or the province. Right, but when it says, Christine, that commercial and industrial education rates are decreasing by 29.6%, um, that's giving the province less money for education, correct? Okay, the, we don't pay the province of Ontario for the education. We pay the school boards directly. So right. the amount that we're going to uh, decrease to the school boards, the rest of it that the shortfall would be made up by the province of Ontario directly. Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of an upper level matter. I realize that. And I just saw those ads on TV where they're saying that the government's cutting our education funding. I'm Point thinking, of order, Mr. Chair. TV ads have nothing to do with this recommendation. <laughs> I, was I appreciate that, Councillor. I was so, trying to explain my thinking, but it's it's okay. Never mind. Your question's been answered, Councillor Gatward? Somewhat. Okay. Any other questions on 7.1.4? Get a mover. I guess we didn't have that before. I had, we had Councillor Coleman on that and, and second by Councillor Bell. All those in favor? Yes. Opposed? That is carried. Okay, so that uh, takes care of everything that needs to be uh, approved. Uh, 7.2, consent items to be received, noting that there is an additional one, 7.2.7, .7, uh, and I believe Councillor Ferrier wanted to speak to that one. So if I could get a motion to go 7.2.1 nope, nope. to 7.2.6. Point, point of clarification. Point of clar Mine is actually a notice of motion I'd like to add to 7.2.2. 0.2, my apologies. Thank you no for that clarification. So if I could get a mover for 7.2.1 and then 7.2.3 through to 0.7. Councillor Howes, Councillor Bell, anybody want any of those pulled out? Seeing none, all in favor of everything but 7.2.2. Yes. Opposed? That is carried. Uh, okay, 7.2.2, a mover to get it on the floor. Councillor Ferrier, second. Mayor Bailey. Um, Councillor, you wanted to speak to that? Yeah, so so I, I spoke to the the um, uh, staff about how to do this, but I'd like to actually to, to make a notice of motion uh, on this because of the tight timelines um, that I'd, I'm, I'm going to bring uh, to the next uh, meeting we have, a uh, council, meeting of council uh, as a whole, uh, to nominate Jim Harder for this and I've talked to a couple of councillors uh, and members of council and I've talked to the mayor about this. Um, so I'd like to bring notice of motion that I will be bringing a motion to have council nominate uh, resident Jim Harder for this award. Councilor Chambers. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we can waive notice of motion if that would uh, expedite the, uh, uh, the, the resolution. And I'd be prepared to move that we waive notice of motion to allow the motion to uh, be presented. Second, second for that. Second, we. Councillor Wheat seconds that. So we are removing the notice of motion, which means that the the motion is coming forth tonight. Okay. So um, I, if I can, then um, do I do that now or later in the in the? You, you just have to call the question first, Mr. Chairman. Yep. On no, waiving notice of motion. Yep. Any, um, it's moved and seconded. Any other questions on waiving the notice of motion? All those in favor? Yes. Opposed? Okay, that is carried. So, Councillor Ferrier, if you'd like to put your motion on the floor. Yeah, I, I have a motion, <laughs> and I, I believe it's seconded by Mayor Bailey uh, to uh, have Council nominate Jim Harder, who's been an uh, an incredible uh, advocate in our community for seniors, for youth, uh, as a teacher, educator, principal, volunteer, senior, uh, and uh, and a civic-minded person uh, for this uh, award. Okay, and you forgot referee. He refereed for years as well. I did. Well, that's the one. That's the one capacity I didn't know him in. <laughs> okay. Um, any? We have it moved and seconded. Any conversation questions on that? Councillor Gatward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When I read this, 
I thought it was uh, available for anyone to make a, a nomination uh, for a Senior of the Year Award because anybody that's nominated will receive a certificate. And then I believe it will be up to the province to choose who they wish to um, award it to. So I was thinking of somebody and may nominate them, but I wanted to see how long they've been involved um, since they've been a senior. I think I know, but I wanted to get correct information and make sure they want to be nominated before I do. I, I don't know, Mr. Harder, but I did hear what um, Mr. LaFerriere said and um, certainly sounds like he's worthy. And I'm sure the same could apply in other communities around the county for um, other areas that councillors may want to nominate someone. So that's my comment. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I may nominate somebody myself. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on this motion? Councilor Ferrier. Yeah, just to speak that. But... Uh, that, and that uh, council nominate, uh, and I guess through the clerk, the clerk would be the person actually nominating uh, Jim in this uh, situation on behalf of council. Uh, but that doesn't preclude anybody else in the community or any other council members from nominating anyone else. Right. Okay, we have it moved, we have it seconded. All those in favor of the motion? Yes. Opposed? That is carried. Thank you for that, Councillor. Okay, moving on to number. Sorry? Well, that somebody was saying something there. Moving on to uh, section eight staff reports, 8.1 OPP detachment board proposal. Uh, Robin, are you out there? I'm not sure if you wanted to speak to this. It's pretty straightforward. We will move the recommendation. Okay, seconder for the recommendation, Councillor Coleman. Robin, I'm not sure if you wanna speak to this. Uh, yes, I can speak to this, just one second. Okay, so uh, the province passed the Ontario Police Services Act, Bill 168, and as a result, um, the municipality has the opportunity to have input on um, the composition and the number of OPP detachment boards in the county. So we have um, a deadline of June 7th to submit our um, proposal. So we uh, took the proposal first to the police services board for their input. And um, their input is um, included in the recommendation in this report, which is to add one additional um, community appointee and to continue with just one board. Um, I believe they've also um, provided a memo from the um, police services board um, which basically states the same thing. Okay, thank you for that. Any questions for Robin? Councillor Gatward? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Originally, when this came forward, the OPP was intending to get rid of multiple detachments within one service area. And... Um, an example would be Oxford County where they had multiple police service boards, but only um, one force. And um, certainly we only have one detachment for our whole community, which makes things simple. And I believe that the current Police Services Act only allows us to have five members However, when the new one is enacted that Robin mentions in her report, um, then and she said it's the new act is um, anticipated, it'll be proclaimed in early 2022. So not until it's enacted could we appoint a sick person, I believe to be correct, to the board. I think that um, our board is unbalanced right now, and we have members from the north, two members. We have two members 
from the West and one member from Paris, and we have no members from the South and East parts of the county. So I could certainly support this if we could advertise for a board member from those areas, because I think it's important to have representation from all areas of the county. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that, Councillor. And it's my understanding when the, the 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 appointed positions are advertised for, anybody can go for them. So um, I, I don't think we can we can suggest that it has to be from this area or that area. It's open to the public for anybody to apply. Uh, Mayor Bailey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And also the two provincial appointments. I mean, we have no control over who the province appoints and where they live. So. Um, usually the provincial appointments change with the government and uh, obviously it's got nothing to do with where they live. It's a, a, obviously it's a vetting pro process and they could all be from one place. They could all be from Oakland and it, it would just be because it was. Because it was. So, so I, I don't know that Councillor Gatwood, you're going to be able to get your equal distribute, uh, distribute your equal vote of the whole county because of the appointments. And um, and we also did at police services, we did think that if, um, if, if council thinks that six is too many, we would cut down the one provincial appointment and we thought there was more value in having people from the community. Um, again, because of exactly what Councillor Gatward said, then we could make sense of where they lived and what was represented. So if, if you think that six, um, as recommended by the Police Services Board, is too many, we can still do five with one provincial appointment and uh, two, two from the uh, community. Okay. Yeah, so let's, let, we'll, we'll deal with the motion that's in front of us right now. We'll see how that goes. Um, and also just, uh, mm -hmm. Councillor Miller, go ahead. Um, Mayor Bailey triggered a question in my mind related to what Councillor Catward was talking about and where that person lives. Do the people that the county appoints, do they not have to reside in the county of Brant? And that is my understanding, yes. And is that the same for the provincial appointees? Or do they have to have a business here? Um, do we know this? I'm not 100% on that, Councillor. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, do you know? Well, I, 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 I know that one of our one of our board members don't live in the county, I don't believe. Right, but they, yeah, they, they just does business in the county. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You probably nodded her head. Um, so I, I guess what going back to what Councillor got we were talking about looking at where the uh, individual resides, asking for fair representation. I don't think that's I think that's a far fetched idea. Um, it, it, and I know when uh, we were having those community discussions, it was nice to have somebody from your area on the police services board at those meetings to answer questions. They knew the people just a little bit better. So um, I don't know if, if, if it's possible, but I, it, it's something I, you know, I'd like to see. I think uh, when we do appoint somebody, I hope it's something that we do take into consideration. I mean, as well as their, you know, desire to serve on the police services board for the right reasons. But I, I think it's something that should play a bit of, bit of a role in our decision. Right. Uh, Councillor Gatward and then Mayor Bailey. And, and just to clarify, I didn't say I was opposed to increasing the number. I just said that I would hope that it would make the board more balanced by appointing another <clears throat> municipal member. And certainly when we had missing people, at times there was meetings where we only had I think a couple of times, three people at our meeting because two provincial appointees were still in the wind and hadn't been appointed yet. Yeah, well, thank and you. Just, and thanks, Councillor. And just to add to that, if I could, um, part of the discussion as well is the fact that the uh, provincial appointed members, they're actually finished in February. So there is that time span between February and the end of term that we will be down the two provincial uh, elected members. So part of the thought process was uh, um, one of the one of the thoughts was to add an additional community member that would be on for the full term 
um, as as council would be. So that uh, to to Councillor Gatward's point there, that would uh, alleviate any of the uh, um, issues of not being able to get a quorum. Uh, Mayor Bailey. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, and, and I agree with Councillor Miller 100%. I think the extra appointment by the, the county uh, would let us put players all over the county so that we were equally represented. But always know that the province with their appointment can skew all of our numbers just by, because they don't, they don't care about the same things as we do. Um, right. just, just to know that. Okay. Any other questions to the recommendation? We have a comment. Go ahead, Councilman. Yes, and the whole, all of the county is represented by the mayor. The mayor represents every area of the county, not just St. George. Duly noted. Okay, we do have a recommendation that's moved and seconded. No further questions on that. All in favor? Yes. Opposed? That is carried. Uh, moving on to 8.2. Um, RPT-21-138, the demolition of 12 Broadway Street. Uh, Pam, I see you coming into focus here. Um, can I get a mover to put the recommendation on the floor? Councillor Howes, Councillor Coleman. Pam, did you want to speak to this? Just here for questions and answers. Okay. Any questions about the recommendation to Pam? Councillor Gatworth. Um, I just want to say thank you for um, expediting this and the my question is will the applicant be able to move forward now with his demolition permit? Uh, yes, uh, through the chair to Councillor uh, Gatward. Yes, it's my understanding that when the minutes are approved on the 29th, 25th of this month rather, um, that we'll be able to issue the demolition permit then. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? We, we yes. Yeah. Opposed? That is carried. You're, you're muted, Chair. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, moving on to 8.2.1, the Brand Heritage Committee report of May 12th. Is that part of the 8.2? Yes, Mr. Chair, that's correct. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay, so moving on to Section 9, communications. Uh, there is a, a memo in there that was alluded to earlier in regards to the uh, Police Services Board for the OPP detachment proposal. Um, I think we just get a recommendation to receive. Councillor Howes, Councillor Gatward, any questions on that? All those in favor? Yes. Opposed? That is carried. Okay, on to number 10, uh, other business. Uh, Councilor Miller, you had something? Yeah, yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I'm just, I wanna ask uh, if staff or any uh, anybody around this table um, knows why we were without power over such a wide area twice. And I see, um, there's some work being done on the third concession in regards to hydro and is that connected? And if nobody knows, that's fine. It's, it's not a council business, but uh, sometimes it's nice to be able to answer questions when people call and take my ear off because their hydro went out, even though we don't have anything to do with it. But I'd like to, sometimes it's nice to have answers. Anybody online can speak to that? Mr. Bradley. Mr. I can just say that we've received no notice of any planned outages uh, that I'm aware of, but uh, we can look into that further. So. Okay. You're good with that, Councillor? Well, I, yeah, no, I, I'll have to be, I'll, I'll do my own research, but uh, just, uh, I think, I know Friday, I think it was Friday, we were out over a wide area, and then Saturday night, um, I believe almost the whole county was out except for parts of Ward 5, so, in, in huge parts of Brantford into Oxford. So I'm surprised nobody's heard anything and nothing in the paper. So I'll, I guess I'll do some digging. Oh, Councillor Chambers. Chambers. Yeah, I, I seem to recollect that I got notice uh, of a planned outage uh, several weeks ago uh, with the time and date, which could have been uh, what Councillor Miller is, is speaking to. If you uh, subscribe to the Ontario Hydro or Power One or whatever they call it, 
app that you can a note that you can sign up for notifications such as that. And I believe I did get notice, uh, but that was several weeks ago. I, I I can't be specific, but I believe it was a planned outage. All right, so Councilor Miller, you'll you'll investigate that a little further then? Yeah, I suspect the one might have, but I don't think the first one was. So and it's interesting that they were both over such a, a similar area, but a huge geographic area. So, okay, mm -hmm. appreciate the answer, Councilor Chief. Yep, no worries. Okay, nobody else said anything about uh, anything else for other business, so we will move on. Can I get a motion to move into camera? Councilor Coleman, Councilor McAlpine. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. We are moving into camera. We're just going to go straight in, folks. Just, just confirming the stream is off. It's good. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're good. Okay. So we've got. Uh,